So uh, thanks for coming to my presentation today. Uh, my name is Jimmy T. I am a PhD student from Queensland University of Technology. Also, on the side, I run a small app development company called Eat More Pixels with Zach here. <coughs> so today, I am going to tell you some things that I found while I was digging around in Gameplay Kit. So Gameplay Kit is introduced in June this year uh, during WWDC. And this is a framework that is, it is a new framework. It is available on both iOS 9 and OS 10 El Capitan. So if you're interested in the things that I've talked about today, uh, you'll need to download the Xcode 7 beta uh, if you want to develop it on iOS app. And if you wanted to deploy it on Mac apps, you ha you'll need to run the OS 10 El Capitan beta. So bear that in mind. So what is Gameplay Kit, really? Um, Gameplay Kit is not actually a piece of technology you can use um, when you build your app. It is actually a set of tools that Apple has, has designed to help us during um, various points um, while you're making a game, for example. So the way that Apple has designed Gameplay Kit is that these tools are cleanly separated from the game's um, rendering process. So what that means is you can apply Gameplay Kit into your game regardless of the underlying um, game engine that you use. So, for example, if you're building a 2D game, you can use Gameplay Kit with Sprite Kit. Or if, you use, if you're building a 3D game, you can use um, Gameplay Kit together with Scene Kit. It is even um, flexible enough to be used with some third-party game engine like um, Unity or Cocos 2D if you want. But generally, with everything Apple's made, it, it works best if you sort of use it together with framework that Apple has created. Um, so, to be, to be honest with you, I'm not really expert in building game. I'm just sort of interested in making game and, you know, I'm a PhD student. I try my best to procrastinate instead of writing my thesis. So, when Apple introduced this framework, I thought, this is cool. I'll look into it. So, today I'll show you um, a few things that I have learned so far while looking into um, gameplay kits. So, in particular, I'll be talking about four of the tools here. So entities and components, state machines, um, pathfinding, and random sources. All right, so to help me explain how do we apply these tools um, into our process of making a game, um, I'm going to pretend that um, we're trying to make an awesome AAA game title here. So this is the thing that we're going to make. Right, so we're, make, we're trying to make a game that uh, works like Pac-Man. So hopefully all of you know how Pac-Man works. Um, so I won't spend time explaining how, what game Pac-Man is. Hopefully everyone knows what that is. So the first thing that uh, I'll be talking about is entities and components. So when I am looking into this, I feel this is, uh, instead of a tool, it feels more like a software engineering practice that Apple actually tries to encourage us to adopt in our project while we're building our game. Um, this is not a new um, practice. It is actually quite a common practice in game development, apparently. So um, Apple is kind of playing catch up in this sense. Um, it's been used in many games such as the uh, Dungeon Siege, The Thief, Resistance series, uh, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 3. So, some games, they talk, uh, some games company, they review how they build their games, and they've talked about using um, entities and component system in, during their process. So usually they call it ECS, entities and component system. Um, so what is entities and components, really? Um, before I explain to you what it is, I'm going to pretend that we don't know about ECS, and we're going to try and build our Pac-Man game um, using the classic um, inheritance model. Right, so we have our Pac-Man game. It has a few characters in it. So it has this guy and a whole bunch of ghosts and some things that, some food that Pac-Man likes to eat. So the first goal that I'm trying to do is to get something to display on the screen. So naturally, I have a, a base class, say, call it renderable. 
right? And I have two direct subclasses from renderable Pac-Man and Ghost. Um, and once I'm happy with um, my class structure now, I remember that I need to control Pac-Man, right? So um, I have some, some code that makes Pac-Man controllable, and I decided to make controllable a subclass of renderable. So Pac-Man is now a subclass of controllable, and Ghost is a direct subclass of renderable, because Ghost doesn't need to be controllable by the player. Um, but later on, I decided to make my game more interesting. Say, I wanted to turn Pac-Man now into a multiplayer party game, right? So I thought of some, some other characters to be added into my game. So, for example, I wanted to add, say, for example, a playable ghost. So a second or third player can now act as the ghost and try to chase Pac-Man down. Or to make the game a little bit more, a little bit harder, I can have an invisible ghost. So adding, new, uh, adding more and more characters into the game introduced uh, a lot of headache in my class structures because, as you can see now, say, take invisible ghost, for example. Invisible ghosts naturally should inherit from ghosts because I want to reuse some of the properties and code I've written for ghosts. But it's not renderable because it's not displayed on the screen. How would I rearrange things now? And what about playable ghosts? So playable ghosts should be a subclass of controllable in order to make it controllable by the player. But ghost isn't really a controllable, a controllable subclass. So, as you can see, once you add more and more um, things into your game, um, it becomes harder and harder to manage under the classic sort of uh, object-oriented sort of class hierarchy. So this is where Gameplay Kit and ECS comes in to help you. Um, so ECS introduces a new way to think about structuring your classes in your project. Um, so it breaks things into two um, major categories. So on the one hand, we have entity. So entity is, actually entity follows more closely to our traditional classes kind of sort of paradigm. You have, um, the way I see it is, um, you, it, with an entity, that's where you hold data and um, information needed for that class. So entity matches closely to what we have in our classes before. Everything inherited from the root class, which is the entity class. So on the other hand, you have, you have a, a new thing called components. And components is where you add functionalities to your class. So uh, components dictates what that class is capable to do, things that the class do, and including its interactions with other classes as well. So to illustrate my point, um, this is how I will reorganize my code under the ECS system. So you have a root class, the entity class, where Pac-Man and Ghost inherit from, and then you can put uh, the new Ghost characters as a subclass of Ghost class. So everything now flows um, very nicely. It follows the semantic meaning of those classes. So invisible Ghost, playable Ghost are subclass of, of the generic Ghost. And um, we separate out all the things that these classes do into components. So these classes, they can add and remove components as I see fit. So um, to begin with, I have the renderable components. So I add them to these classes that need to be shown on the screen. And I have controllable components and respawnable components as well. So they are added and removed from classes as I see fit. So invisible ghost doesn't need to implement renderable, doesn't need to be doesn't need to be controllable, it just needs to respond. So as you can see, you can add and remove things very, very easily, and it doesn't destroy your class hierarchy. This is an orthogonal kind of access to the whole class hierarchy. You can add and remove stuff very easily using components. So in, in the technical sense, um, how do you implement the component system in your classes? Um, so Gameplay Kit has this thing called GK Component System, and um, it's, a, it's a collection class. So think of it as a, an array or a set that contains 
all the same type of component in your game. So if you look at my example previously, I have three um, renderable components. I have two controllable components and two respondable components. So I will, ha I will end up having three GK component systems and say my GK, uh, one of them would handle all my renderable components, one of them would handle all, my, all of my respondable components and so on. So um, you can add those components to your entities and then add them into the system. And then what your game does is it would periodically call these systems and then tell each of these individual components to say, hey, um, say every frame you say, hey, time to update, do whatever you want with the functionality, and then that's it. So they, are all, they all tr will figure out what they need to do themselves. Um, the classes don't need to handle the components directly. So that is ECS. The second thing uh, is state machines. As you know, um, games rely a lot on states because, um, for example, game has uh, the start menu, the gameplay screen, and the game over screen. So all of that can be handled by using state machines. And a lot of the characters in the game, they would do things differently depending on the current state of the game. So state machine is quite integral to, to games. So in our example, um, we have these Q characters, ghosts, and if you know Pac-Man very well, um, these ghosts, they would do different things under different states. You might notice that ghosts turn into a different color and different face um, when Pac-Man has eaten a power-up, right? And it would behave differently in that, in that mode. So let's look, let's look into that in a little bit more detail here. Uh, so we have this ghost character, and this ghost character actually has four distinct states. So it starts in the respawn state, and usually goes into the chase state, and when Pac-Man eats the power-up, it would, goes into the flee state, and then if you successfully eat the ghost during the power-up phase, it would go into a defeated state, and then respawn and rinse and repeat. However, the um, relationship between each state isn't that straightforward. So, for example, you can jump around states, and in certain states, so you can go back to the previous state, or in some cases, there's only a one-way direction. So, for example, you can't go back to defeated state from respawn, but you can jump back and forth between chase and flee, for example. Um, and the same things go, the same arguments go here. Like once you start adding more and more state to your characters, things can easily go out of hand. So for example, if I wanted to expand this game and introduce things like a patrol state where I wanted the ghost to go from checkpoint to another checkpoint, or if I wanted to have a, a mode where ghosts would cooperate and try to chase down the Pac-Man cornering him from all different corners, for example, so, and then I have to start to think about, okay, is it possible to get from one state to another? And what do I do when I change the state? What do I do when I get out of the, the, a particular state? So there are all, a lot of that, and it's easy to introduce error and bugs in your, in your game that way. So Gameplay Kit um, gives us a way to, uh, to, I guess, to minimize error and, and bugs in our game through a class called GK state. So usually uh, your game will have one single GK state machine and the state machine will handle going in and out uh, in, from various states. So when you are designing a state, um, what you need to have is um, what are the possible states from this current state. So that is provided by implementing the method um, is valid next state. So in here, you specify a list of um, valid next state coming out from this state. So for example, if you're implementing respawn, your potential uh, valid next state could be chase and maybe flee, for example. And you may want to provide the code that, that do something when we enter the state. So for example, if you're entering flee state, 
Um, you might want it to change the appearance of the ghost. You might want it to change the move speed of the ghost. And also, uh, so that's handled during um, did enter with previous state. And then um, maybe you wanted to have something, you wanted to do something when we exit the state. So you can do that using will exit with the next state. So that will also tell you which, which state you're transitioning into. And as, as with the component system, um, the state will be periodically notified with a method called update with delta time. Um, so the state can decide to do things that it needs to do periodically as well. So um, you might notice a, simil a very, very sort of similar pattern with a lot of things with game. So they, s almost all of them depend on having a run loop which constantly kind of pull every single component in the game to do something. Um, and this is how Gameplay Kit choose to do it using update with delta time. Okay. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is pathfinding. So uh, as you know, uh, in games, a lot of the time, things need to get from one location to another location on the level. And uh, sure, you might think you can code all these movements manually um, uh, with code, but things can get complicated very, very quickly, especially when you have a complicated uh, level design. And uh, we'll, you know, we as programmer, we wanted to try and make things automated or to avoid writing as many code as possible. So the whole notion of pathfinding actually comes from a classic uh, mathematical or computer science problem called, uh, foundation called graph theory. So in graph theory, uh, the idea is every single valid position on the level can be represented by uh, a node on the graph. And if you, link, um, if you link two nodes on the graph, it represents, say, you can validly travel from one location to the other. And there's always a cost associated with the travel. It could be uh, the distance, or it could be an energy you need to spend in order to perform that travel in your game. And so graph theory of, uh, provides you a way you can calculate what is the optimal route going from point A to point B, or is it possible to go there without repeating your route, et cetera, and et cetera. Um, so I don't want to bore you with the mathematical detail, but this thing works, right? And Gameplay Kit is there to help us to avoid doing all these maths and um, to get the result directly. So um, how do we apply it in Pac-Man? So in Pac-Man, um, a classic pathfinding problem is we have this guy here who is trying to run away from the ghost normally, and we have a ghost who tries to chase him down. So in order for the ghost to find the Pac-Man, um, it needs to know how to get to Pac-Man's current position, and that's where pathfinding comes in, right? And how do we model our Pac-Man game in the whole pathfinding sort of graph way? So if you look at the level of Pac-Man, um, actually the entire level can fit nicely onto like a graph setting, right? So all the, every single position on the, on the, on the level can, rep, can be represented by a point on the, on the graph in a, in a grid fashion. And that's exactly how um, we can do it in Gameplay Kit, right? So in here, I've chose to represent the entire level using a two by two matrix, uh, yeah, two by two, 2D matrix, um, where, uh, 2D matrix. So um, in here, all the ones represent um, invalid location and zero or walls, if you want to call it, and zero represents path uh, or valid location, and then I think three represent the respawn point for the Pac-Man, and two represent respawn point for the ghost. So um, once you've got this set up or designed, um, Gameplay Kit has a really nice way to you, for you to generate the entire graph. So Gameplay Kit actually has a class called GK Grid Graph, which um, allows you to very quickly kind of map the entire thing um, into a graph. So in here, I've, I've represent every single valid point on the level, 
using a node. So I just need to call add nodes and add all the, all the relevant points in there. You can remove it, you can connect nodes. Um, but once you've got your, your graph set up properly, um, all you need to do to find out the path from one point to another is by calling find path from node to node. And Gameplay Kit will do all the math, figure out what's the optimal path, and then tell you how do you get there node by node. So that is very useful, and you don't have to deal with any of the math at all. So that's, that's great. I think that's really useful. Uh, but even if your game doesn't actually map onto a nicely, uh, an, into a grid laid out nicely, Apple's got you covered as well. So Apple has a more generic graph called GK Obstacle Graph, which you can use for games that look like this. So this is an example that Apple's provided. Um, in here, you have a more uh, kind of 3D game design where the character is trying to get from the lower left to the middle right green dot. So naturally, in your game level, you will have obstacles. So in here, they've chose to represent obstacles using, uh, a f using four nodes forming a, a rectangle. But actually, um, you can represent your obstacle using any kind of polygon shapes. And once you've got these nodes added onto your, into your graph, you can, just like how we did it using the grid graph, you can form paths, you can form links between the nodes, and then once you've got all the links set up, you just call the same method, find path from node to node, and Gameplay Kit will figure all that out for you. So this is um, really useful. And in the case of an obstacle graph, you can even specify things like buffer radius. So um, Gameplay Kit will know not to move your character too close to the, to the corner or to provide some sort of buffer distance between your character and obstacles in, in the, on the level. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is random source. So if you have game, randomness is a really good way to add fun and replay value to your game. And games have quite unique random number needs. So if you've attended Louis' talk this morning, I, I think he's talked about the bad things happen when you don't use random properly. And uh, I have less sort of worry about cryptographic stuff in games, but games do have some um, pretty unique needs. So, um, so for example, when you're making a game, especially cross-platform, you might want to ensure that you generate the same random number sequence in order to give every players on the, on different platform uh, a fair, I guess, a fair experience. Or sometimes you don't want to have a very random number distribution. Like you want it to actually skew it a little bit, or you might want it to have a very uniform distribution or a very sort of a bell curve distribution in some cases. And Gameplay Kit is very useful in this sense. I'll tell you a little bit more um, later. So doing random is very difficult. If you, uh, you, know, you have to remember to do seed properly, you have to use seed in the right way, um, if you ask around, people might tell you, you know, you know don't use RAND, use ARC for random. Um, and it's also very tricky if your game needs to be absolutely very random. And what do I mean by that is, um, so let me ask you a question. So if randomness is important in your game, right, and say if we're trying to get a random number between 0 and 5, what would you think of? Like, what would you normally do when you're trying to get a random number between 0 and 5? What's that? Arc for random. Arc for random. And then what do you do to get 0 to? Modulo? Mod 5? Yes. That's, that's what I would, I would do, right? I wouldn't even think twice. Like, that's natural. Works. Um, but if randomness is really important to you, turns out there is actually a bias if you, in, in, the, in the result that you generate. Um, if you use modulo like this. So I'll show you with a, with a quick example. So assuming, <laughs> assuming your system has uh, defined RAN max to be 7. So just for example, the, the maximum number you get from RAN is 7. 
And you, if you try to do a modulo of five, um, you will find that you have a higher chance of getting zero and one for, uh, for your random result because now there are actually two numbers that map to zero and two numbers that map to one. So six and zero maps to zero, one and seven maps to one, right? So if you count your chances, there are a higher chance to get zero and one from your result. And if, if you want every number to have the same amount of chance, then this is kind of skew and bias, right? Well, you might think, you know, it depends on what the RAND max on my system is. Like, if I pick the right number, if my modulo divides my RAND max completely, then I don't, ha I don't have to worry about this problem. So I actually, um, I had a look at what RAND max is defined as on iOS, and it turns out it is this number, 2 to the power of 31 minus 1. Um, it's a big number. I don't know what it is exactly, but what's important is it is actually the 8. It's a prime number in short. Right? So what that means is it, you can't easily, well, it, you can't find num another number that divides it completely. And what that means is unless you're taking modulo of the prime number itself, you will always have some bias in your random number result. So uh, it's, doing random number is, is tricky and difficult. So this is why um, I wanted to persuade you to use Gameplay Kit. So Gameplay Kit provides you not just one, but three random sources you can pick from. And each of them has different um, random properties. So the first one is linear congruential random source. Um, so this is the one that works, I guess, computationally the fastest to generate, but it's also the least impressive in terms of random properties. And then the second, second thing is called machine twister. Awesome name. Um, it is also very random, but it is the most computationally expensive one to generate. And the third one is called Arc4. And in Apple's word, Arc4 is going to be your Goldilocks random source. So this is the one that hit the balance between performance and random properties. Um, I do have to say it. Um, these GK random sources, they are there for um, game and I guess normal application purposes, they're not for cryptographic purposes. So if you're doing anything to do with um, secure coding or uh, some you know, banking stuff, don't ever try to use GK random sources. Um, I, I guess you have to ask Louis for more information. Um, It's, well, it's very tempting because it works really well. Like it has a lot of, uh, it has a lot of uh, convenience methods, right? So this is the one that I really uh, like using as well. So I don't know if you have ever encountered situations where you need to randomly shuffle things in an array. So there is a convenience method here by, provided by GK Random Source that you can shuffle things in an array and then it would return to you the array with things shuffled. So this is array shuffling objects in an array by shuffling objects in an in array. This is very useful. Uh, and once you pick your random source, you can, so you can generate a GK random distribution from it, and the distribution has a lot more convenience methods as well. So if, you, if your game deals with dice, you can have D6 for six-phase dice, D20 for 20-sided dice, and you can even have a die that, that have a, has a custom side count. So you can do that by calling this class method distribution for die with side count, and then just type in the number of sides you have um, you need for your, for your die. And once you've created that distribution, every time you need a random number out of it, you just call next int. And it will give you the next random number. Very simple, easy to remember. No modulo, nothing to worry about. And if you need, um, if you need to have a slightly different uh, distribution, and this is where it becomes really useful. In addition to GK random distribution, there's also GK Gaussian distribution. So Gaussian distribution would provide you with a sort of a bell curve distribution for 
your random results. So it's not technically random, but uh, it's helpful in some situations in your game particularly. So like if you have drops in your game, you might want to make it more frequent to drop normal items, and you want to make some legendary or rare drops more least frequent. So this is an easy way to achieve that uh, effect. Um, or if you're making, I don't know, card games, or even for some apps where you need to shuffle things, um, and you want to make sure every item is given sort of similar number of, of times as a result. So there is GK shuffle distribution that will make sure um, every, every number is given the, fair, the same number of time um, being outputted as a result. Um, so, yeah, I think this, this, uh, the one on the right would be quite useful if you're making, uh, say, a music app where you wanted to shuffle a playlist and you want to make sure every song gets played the same number of times, for example. Okay, so that, with that said now, um, this is my advice that I give to everyone. So if, you're, if you need random number for games, use GK random. So that covers the four thing that I wanted to share with you today. And um, there are actually a couple more really cool stuff in Gameplay Kit. So there is like agents. Agents is really cool if you need to move objects in your game in a realistic manner. So it allows you to specify properties like keep certain distance between the entities or uh, have them flock around using a particular behavior and Gameplay Kit will drive those movement and give you really realistic movement without you doing all the, all the movement codes. And if you're making a turn-based game, MinMax AI is really good. It gives you an easy way to, Im to implement an AI in your game. Um, if your game has a lot of uh, objects that move around and need some kind of logic themselves, you can look into rule system as well. It, it is a really good way to simplify your uh, object, object rule system, I guess. Yeah, so that covers all of my slides. Thank you. <laughs>